Is the light like reflecting off my bald head back at you guys? Are you good? Um, so, did you know that they have chicken wings back stairs? I just ate like 30 of them at the break, so I'm pretty full, and if there's a bunch of sauce on my face, I apologize. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about youth, but I'm not gonna talk for the youth because they have their own voices. But first, I wanna acknowledge some of the elders in my life, including my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother's grandmother was born in the Papa Chase Cree Nation that used to exist, and uh, she reminds me of that every single time she drives in the Hazeldean. She looks at my house and she's like, this house is good. When they tear down all the other ones, you can keep it. And I'm like, I don't know if that's gonna happen, Grandma, but. All right, chicken wing, done. Grandmother, done. All right, this is my home. The land means everything to me. I'm just another part of the circle. When I work with youth who are lost in a myriad of government-imposed systems, this connection has often been broken. And how do we bring that connection back? How do we engage with the land in a respectful manner? The answers are with the youth and the elders. They're not with some government policy or a university research report or some random panel on children's services they've done three times in the last six years with no indigenous representation. This building a community culture that youth can find their spirit in. I was raised with a whole bunch of elders. This is my buddy Bob. Bob and I spend a lot of time on Enoch together, uh, mainly chopping wood. That's actually all we pretty much do. Uh, and we also hunt moose. That's our two things. We hunt moose and we chop wood. And Bob and I talk quite a bit about how we can bring the youth back, specifically urban youth, and how we can connect them back to these landscapes, how we can involve them in these cultural aspects. In one of my former jobs, I worked with kids who were at the Edmonton Young Offenders Center. And you know, these guys, they wouldn't want to leave Edmonton or do anything. And I'd be like, hey, want to come chop wood with me? And they're like, that sounds like a terrible idea. I do not want to do that whatsoever. I'm like, come on, man, like, come on out. I'll buy you a pack of smokes. They're like, which is kind of culture. And they're like, yeah, for sure, I'll do that. And so they come out to chop wood, and you know, we chat. Bob would chat with him. He'd tell them stories. He'd tell them stories about his own life, about his own culture. Oh, that picture of Bob with his axe, he really wanted me to get his new axe in that picture. He's like, you're going to know lots of ladies who like a good axe. And I was like, I'm probably. <laughs> so I got to go through a few of these cards here. All right, there we go. I don't really follow my own speaking notes at all. So the mountains and the rivers have been my knowledge sources. They've been my family's and closest confidence. When someone insults the North Saskatchewan, I feel my heartache as if you're insulting the wisdom of my grandparents. I see the spirit of the youth and elders reflected in water and mountains. I see them move through this country, country's landscape, struggling to refine their place, struggling to rise above societal structures that ask you to take and take from what was once a land that was respected above everything. As someone who looks the way I do, I'm often asked thinly veiled questions by people who wouldn't feel comfortable saying the same thing if they were talking to Bob. And you've, you've heard all these before, but you know the classics, like, why does so-and-so get so much money from blah, blah, blah? And like, why don't they just get over it? And when I was younger, I wasn't confident in exposing this or even talking about this. But now, fuck that. <laughs> if you're coming to me with venomous words, I'm going to call you out for your racist behavior. Have you ever felt that you couldn't go somewhere based on your ethnicity? Have you ever felt scared to exist within your own culture? Have you ever felt that the country you live in has closed off its doors to you? It's not your fault that Canadian society has hidden the land, the culture, and the history of Indigenous people. But if you think Canada is racism-free, simply read the comments on any online news article, or look at how our government continues to spend millions of dollars arguing in courts to prevent Indigenous children from having access to what other children have. But, and, <laughs> and so all these people, they always want these answers, but there's a simple place to start. Start just having those make it awkward conversations with your friends, with your family and colleagues when they perpetuate that racism. Look at the way indigenous women are continually portrayed in the media. Question that. Why is their society putting that in place? And so now, I brought a bunch of TRC calls to actions, even they're outside. Now you know, and now if you leave here and you don't do anything, I will blame you, and now it is on you if you don't start moving forward. Because I am not comfortable having just 38% of the indigenous youth in Edmonton finish high school. Those same youth who fail, bring them out to the land, to the water, to where the spirits roam. They'll find their place. They won't fail out there. 
They learn from the knowledge keepers. We can change the way education is happening. We can start engaging youth on their own terms and working from what they value. They have the answers, not me. They want to be heard. We need to start listening to the land again. In the wild, the land still has a voice. When my family returns to the waterways where our ancestors' voices still sing, and we search with all our hearts for the courage to allow that voice to continue to sing through our daily actions and our conversations. We search for that guiding art. Each rock has its own journey, just like each of us have our own story, and to ourselves, it's the most important narrative ever told. But if we continue to stifle the spirit of the story in our youth and our elders' knowledge, we're continuing colonization. Doesn't matter how often we use that term reconciliation. I like Buffalo, so I took that at Elk Island. We need the stories and the land. We need our voice to connect back to the circle. We need our youth to feel pride and the ability for their spirit to roam in any direction that they choose. Because I sat in that classroom when I was a kid, and I watched as my friends turned into government statistics around me. And I've been through the fires, the suicides, the teachers and guidance counselors who told me to drop out but I am not a statistic, and I will not let my children and my friends' children and those unborn who aren't here yet be defined by statistics, government reports, and university research. So go out and ask your MLAs, your MPs, your city councillors, your employers, your colleagues, your friends, your family, what they are doing to address the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions. Start having that conversation. Read Indigenous literature from Indigenous authors. And that's basically all I got. Listen to that spirit. <laughs> hi, hi, Massey Cho. Well, thank you. Thank you, I'm Connor. I'm shutting up, Mike. <laughs> <laughs>